Second time's the charm. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Brightworks, where we fix audio problems on the fly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, been, uh, been, been fixing things after a little bit of a settings reset. Not sure exactly why that happened, but all my, uh, presets and whatnot have been set back to square one. So hopefully everything sounds all right, crystal clear and coming through nicely. What I've got for you today is supposedly a very, very spicy match on all that glitters. It's a map that I feel duty bound to cover every once in a while, just because of how popular it is on the, uh, on the online multiplayer page it's just one of those maps that comes up all the time right alongside supreme straight so it feels like i should probably cover one of these every once in a while check in on you hooligans make sure that the uh the meta isn't going too far out of balance here spawning in the southwestern corner we have dujavi dujavi coming in at 28 true skill a couple of silver a little peaking of a silver chevron starting to grow underneath that little uh, tail of bronze very very excited to see what they lead for us here as the uh, the blue team leader in the heavy eco position this this position is not uncommon to go for just an afk eco build you just go straight up the t2 ladder get into those advanced fusion reactors and start pumping out marauders razorbacks shiva uh, whatever you can just go absolutely nuts with the eco so i wonder if that's going to be the play here or if we're going to go for something a little bit spicier Spawning across the way and up on the other side of the map, we have the Northwestern spawning red team leader. You know him, you love him. It's Evolved Monkey. That's a name to know and a name to fear uh, when he's on the other team, of course. 38 true skill and the silver chevrons to match. Somebody asked me about this on the stream Wednesdays and Saturdays, by the way, in case you'd like to come hang out with us live. We play a lot of fun games. Humble little sellout right there. Uh, someone asked me on the stream what the chevrons meant, and I feel like now's as good a time as any to mention it. The chevrons were originally, way back in the day, just a mark of exactly how much time you'd spent playing the game. Just your total man hours spent logged in playing the game. What happened was it was changed so that it reflected your leaderboard standing for the current game mode that you were playing in. So if it was team, it would be your leaderboard standing in team. If it was free for all, uh, you know, so on and so forth. It has now been reverted back to the previous state where it now just resembles exactly the total amount of man hours that you have put into the game. I believe it's relative to everyone else, but I could be wrong about that. There could just be a tier list or something like that. But either way, uh, nowadays, all you have to worry about is if you see somebody with silver, uh, yeah, it means they've been playing a good long time. <laughs> it's also no longer indicative of, of skill per se, uh, more so just the amount of time that you've played the game so uh experience but maybe that doesn't mean wisdom i don't know you tell me down below in the comments your take on that nice little snipe here while i was gawking on about the systems of the game uh by our hero here squint who has sent a rover across the map look at that double chevron hero right here about to get shot down by a tick perhaps oh, oh he might actually survive wow that is, a, uh, that is a bold matchup right there, but this rover is actually a hero. If it could snipe all these windmills, that could actually be a tremendous benefit to the blue team here. Shutting down their heavy eco player. Ooh, looks like he's not going to get it. Those ticks will shut him down. That was very, very close. If Vidal lost all of those windmills, that would have set him back quite a ways. Not a lot of resource. Well, actually, let's double check that. I was going to say not a lot of resources, but actually that's about 765, almost 800 metal worth of uh, windmills there. Yeah, I take it back. That could have actually been a really, really huge disaster. I would love to see those windmills spaced out just so that we could avoid that in the future. Either way, though, Squint has done a great job of pushing forward, forward here. Actually, a really aggressive expansion. Um, I don't mind this hold, but you're going to be way better off holding here than you are going to be holding here. Of course, it's all about the surface area that you can create for your units to fire from. Uh, and this is just not a very wide choke point. You, of course, also have an access port through this side, which allows multiple players to attack you at once. Uh, and then, of course, you have to deal with units coming around in this direction, which is also never a good deal. So I'm excited to see what Squint gets up to here. Now, this is, of course, going to let him get that 3.2 metal extractor that's very, very juicy, going to allow for a very uh, healthy economy early on. So I, well, I'm excited to see if that's going to pay off in the long run or whether missing all of these metal extractors on the back end uh, early with that commander is going to cost more than he gains here. That being said, excellent job pushing forward with these construction vehicles, building up all these metal extractors on the path all the way up here. And that being said, yeah, I'm actually really liking that push here. Squint doing an excellent job of maneuvering forward. Meanwhile, Commander Death. Oh, okay. It was just a sacked commander up in the northeast 
uh, corner here for the yellow player who is going up to a T2 lab right on time, four minutes and 50 seconds in, should have that T2 lab out, give or take around the six minute mark and then have those T2s pump it out shortly after that. Very, very standard timings, all stock standard for the eco player there. What are we looking at over here? Commander died over here as well, essentially a mirrored build. A lot more constructors and a lot less uh, a lot less wind power. Well, actually, the wind power is still here. It's just dispersed uh, throughout this area here. But yeah, that's actually a hefty amount of wind power. All right, very nice. Wind is decent on this map. It has a tendency to screw me over specifically, but it'll probably be, it'll probably be fine if you use it. <laughs> I feel like every time I build wind, I get caught with a, uh, a zero wind spree for a good long while, and that causes me uh, quite quite a heartache. Yeah, I'm, I'm really upset about it a lot of the time. Oh, interesting. So this is a nice cheeky little play, an easy way to harass the uh, the front lines here. You just drop a couple of artillery shellers up on top of this uh, this little mountain ridge right here and it gives you the ability to shell down on the enemy who is postured right outside your gates. It's actually very, very annoying to deal with that. Uh, what do you do, right? Your, your options are for air to send gunships, I suppose, to go take that out, but then they can just send fighters or even just light anti-air to go shoot down your gunships. Um, you can try and transport some things, but then if they have fighters, they're going to be able to shoot down the transports relatively easily. Uh, artillery is a decent option here. I think uh, Mose is trying to deal with this with his own Wolverines, try and finish this off. But imagine, I mean, if we put a radar jammer up here too, there's no way you're going to see that. There's a, there's a lot of really, really poor options for dealing with this, um, and not a lot of good ones. <laughs> yeah, you can see just how annoying they are. They're, uh, oh, okay, well, shooting your transport, the transport that brought you here is not exactly a, a proper way to say thank you, but I suppose it'll do. A bomber is going to be the weapon of choice. Okay. Um, yeah, it's going to miss a lot of its bombs here. Conveniently, it just has just so happened to drop a lot of those bombs uh, on top of this one. But yeah, still, again, like I said, it's not like a perfect solution. It's just a mediocre one at best. Very nicely done. I really, really, really like that play by Archangel. Showing us some cheeky little maneuvers, but you do whatever you can to get the advantage up on your enemy. And that's just one way to do it. This is very nice as well. Blitzes were apparently trying to get a little bit of a, a little bit of work done here. Pop Melon has put down a gauntlet already. That's actually a really quick gauntlet. Uh, I was wondering where the units are, but there are no units when you go for holy. Okay, well, <laughs> you know who I'm rooting against at this point now. Uh, Pop Melon has now put down a solid 1,700 metal worth of T1 solar panels, uh, producing 200 and sorry, make it 17,000. Let's call it about 17,000 flat for 220 energy, versus. If we take a look here at Dujavi's economy, which is uh, 1,800 metal, so just uh, about 200 metal more uh, for nearly 800 energy per second. So, I mean, you can you can do the quick maths on your own in your head, but uh, I'm pretty pretty damn sure that that is a whoppingly more efficient trade right there. Uh, not to conjure images of images of a whopper to your mind, but it is uh, it is a, a massive massive trade. Call it the quarter pounder of trades, that's for sure. Why am I talking about Whoppers? Well, anyway, uh, Marls, Marls is, is holding the front line here for green. Very nice. Resign also holding the uh, front line here for red. Nice brown color. Uh, Nacho Man leading up the tech charge in the back here for the lane. He is he is uh, providing a whole lot of artillery support, a lot of, uh, well, vehicle support in general, but artillery is coming out as well as a couple of those medium tanks. It looks like he had a bot lab at some point. Yeah, must have done a little bit of a tech transition here. He does have a T2 con somewhere. I see him queuing up those T2 metal extractors. Must have been handed over. Yeah, it looks like it sure was. Constructor leaving its little footprints in the sand, leading back to Bombardier. Bombardier. <laughs> Lovely to see. Now, this is a nice little position here for the red player. Evo Monkey, who has secured a nice little advantage right through the middle of the map in this sort of section. Very nicely done. Going to be able to cement that area, at least in his control or in his favor for a little while. Not necessarily the strongest stranglehold on this area. A couple of rocket bots would probably tear this down. Ah, but those are dragon claws. 
Dragon Claws are not uh, impervious. They they can take damage, especially from rocket bots, that sort of thing. Excellent degun over here, by the way. Just barely saw that out of the corner of my eye. Squint managed to degun down a whole bunch of medium tanks, taking out effectively all of Nacho Man's army. He's left with just a couple of artillery. That was really, really nice. A bunch of aggression right here in the middle of the map, too. Janus is looking to jump on top of this army while it's small. They see the commander and they smell blood. The Janus's want to fire their rockets. They know that if they can get two or three volleys off, they'll be able to burst down that commander lickety split. Marl's his commander down to 18% and he is smelling the blood in the water, but I don't think he has the sustained armor in order to keep that aggression up and so we will be forced to pull back at the very last second. So close and yet so far. Marl says we'll keep the commander on the front line as portable build power. He sort of needs it there. He has a stunning economy, tons of metal and tons of energy, so I'm excited to see what he's going to go for in the back line here. Looks like teching up to T2 is on his mind. Don't hate that whatsoever. I'd love to see a couple of constructors created here, just two or three, and slapped on the back end of this construction bot. Going to give you a phenomenal boost in build power that will aid you as you build your way forward. Uh, making those T2 metal extractors here. A little bit of a run by some pawns sneaking their way through. Evolved Monkey, very, very good at finding those openings, those uh, opportunity paths that I talk about a lot. Finding where the uh, where the light laser tower defense is the thinnest, finding where the, uh, the opportunities are and using your units in an effective way. Very nicely done. Sweeping across the green and blue here where there are no static defenses and clearing up a lot of those metal extractors. One, two, three, four, five, maybe six or seven will go down here and that's at least going to be, uh, let's call it 14 metal per second down the drain for the blue team. Definitely significant, especially this early on in the game. You can see that reflected in the economies up here where we have roughly 270 going up against roughly 230. Um, yeah, that's going to be a massive advantage here for the red team eventually. It's not an immediate advantage, so it's easy to get over cocky, uh, but it is a advantage eventually here. Now this T2 constructor could make up that difference if we don't see T2 upgrades coming along for the red team, and it looks like indeed we do we do not, at least not for the uh, mirrored opponent here, Resign, who has given that aggression, but he also hasn't gotten the uh, T2 economy up and running. So eventually the metal extractor is going to pay the difference between all of that aggression. Uh, Nacho Man, by the way, has also per punched through here. There is a AFK gauntlet back here. So what I always, always, always recommend you do is take one of those early res bots that you should have made from the early game and use it to suck up all the metal tied up in this gauntlet. 1,250 metal. That's, I mean, you could think of it like a, uh, a third of a fusion reactor, more or less. Maybe closer to a quarter of a fusion reactor, but still. Very, very useful for getting your, your uh, early jump start into T2, especially if you have a massive army fielded as well. Think about how much metal is tied up in that army. You've got about 2,000-ish metal tied up in all of this T1 uh, heavy armor. And if you had all that metal in front of your defensive position here, you're going to be in a great spot. Now, eating up the gauntlet here from Squint is quite nice. Looks like Squint's early aggression did not pay out as he couldn't reinforce that front fast enough, and there just was not enough surface area for him to keep that contested. Nacho Man and Potmelon have already broken through, and so now that is going to be a huge problem. Radar and Radar Jammer have been included here. That's also quite nice. Going to allow for a little bit of a uh, little bit more intelligence gathering. I don't mind it whatsoever. Some Beamer turrets are coming up here. That's quite nice as well. Beamer turrets, of course, very powerful. Very, very good against tick spam of all things. Um, that's just something we see very often, but also they're just a uh, really, really good source of damage per second. As far as DPS goes, uh, we, we had a little pop quiz trivia when we were doing our Raptors game night, and uh, yeah, that was one of the questions, was what turret, what ground turret, I should have said. I, I In the, in the Q&A, I said, what turret has the highest DPS for Armada? Um, but technically, the uh, I believe that it was the Shredder, or what is it called, the Chainsaw, has more, uh, more damage per second. Sorry, I missed a commander death there. Looks like that was Nacho Man's commander going down. Uh, he pulled a significant amount of his army back, though, so at the very least, saving those. Uh, however, he is going to be on the back foot now as the, his commander has gone down, relieving some of the pressure here. Now, blue units are streaming out from Dujavi. He's got a bunch of hounds on the front line. Looks like he ate up that T2 lab eventually to go into an advanced fusion reactor. Don't mind that whatsoever. He contributed units to the front line. He is going into tech. That's kind of exactly what I'd hope for his position here. A little bit of EMP shenanigans over here, allowing these hounds to get a phenomenal trade on a bunch of these medium tanks. It's uh, it's kind of the problem with these medium tanks is that they move, right? Well, they should anyway. <laughs> they should they should move. Um, 
ideally they would be moving, and so it'd be very difficult to hit them. Uh, however, if they're EMP'd, of course, they're not going to be moving very much, so that, uh, that kind of explains that massive wall of thugs right here. The thug army. Squint moving his commander forward here. Maybe he could have gone for a little D-gun there. Yeah, 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 go for a D-gun. You can get a juicy little D-gun there. I mean, easily you could wipe away half of this army, if not the whole thing. Um, okay. Bit, bit, uh, bit of an odd decision making here. Um, not sure exactly what to say about that, but yeah, the, the D-gun would have been the right move to go for there. Could have wiped away at least a couple of those tanks, maybe eight or so or nine or so of those tanks, and uh, allowed you just a bit more time in the back lane here. But now we can see, based on the colors, we have two different armies clashing here, well, engaging here. Uh, Nacho Man as well as Resign are working together to try and break through, but uh, Marlsis is going to be in charge of handling the uh, rep repulsion efforts. <laughs> Forward anti-nuke was built here, a portable anti-nuke, the uh, umbrella. Mobile anti-nuke for Armada, built out of their T2 bot lab. Sniper bots are coming up as well, and those are great to see, especially when everyone is investing heavily in those T1 vehicles. They pop most of those medium tanks. Well, uh, yeah, all the medium tanks with just a single shot, making them very, very efficient on the front line if you mass them in decent enough numbers. Now, that is no easy feat in and of itself, but it is well worth trying to attempt. Interestingly, a gauntlet has been built up here. All right. Very, very peculiar, but I suppose it works. The gauntlet does have a nice little bit of range if it's up on this hill. You can see it actually could fire away quite quite a bit into the distance here, but it doesn't have any vision. I want to quickly show you the blue player's vision here. Oh, actually, it has plenty of vision. Uh, yeah, actually, I completely take that back. At some point, there was vision here, uh, and so this, this uh, gauntlet ought to know what it should be shooting at. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have current vision, but it had uh, previous vision, so you can always micro it there. Fat boy is stepping forward. Using the spy bot to get the vision necessary for that long range fat boy. Fat boy, of course, very, very dangerous. It can contribute a massive amount of damage in a huge AoE. It's uh, it's effectively a Zar on, on legs. Oh, a little bit of a pause there. Looks like one of the blue players did tap out here. Looks like it was uh, this player right in the middle of the map. So Marls is now going to be dealing with a massive front line all the way across here. This is easily three players worth of front line that are now resting on their shoulders. That's a, uh, that's a spicy meatball for sure. Medium tanks have broken through. The lone beamer to save the day. <laughs> uh, beamers are great, mind you, but are they that great? Well, he's uh, given us a convincing showing. Not, not shutting down everything on its own, but certainly taking down four tanks is well worth noting. Oh, those light gunships. Again, we're seeing those more and more here, and I'm not sure it's the right move. They're just, they just don't contribute very much firepower. That was a uh, Hound actually stole that kill with its Gauss Cannon. Hound has different modes that allow you to fire it in various different ways, and one of those ways is with the Gauss Cannon. Gauss Cannon uh, allows it to fire a little bit, a little bit faster and a little bit more frequently at the expense of a little bit of DPS. As my phone is about to die and I better throw it on the charger lest I run out of battery in the middle of the day. Not exactly what I'm hoping for, I guess it's not really the middle of the day. Anyways, nice EMP bot right here. I was giving you a high ground perspective. We can zoom right in and get close on the action. As you can see, all of these hounds have been stunned for a remaining six seconds or so as they uh, deal with their overloaded circuits from that spy bot exploding right next to them. What an interesting concept, the SpyBot EMP explosion. It's such a cool, neat little uh, neat little trick. I remember the first time that ever happened to me, I was so confused. What on earth? Why are my units frozen? And then somebody explained it to me so kindly. That was back in the, the, the days when bar was one or two lobbies at most uh, per day running. And you would, you would join in and you would play with this range of players that went all the way from the pros all the way down to, I mean, anyone who was new to the game. So it was a... Uh, it was a wild time. That was the wild west of bar. <laughs> it's wonderful, by the way, to see this game grow and change and become a whole thing. It really is. I'm getting sentimental now. Remembering old games that, uh, that died. In the arms of angels. <laughs> T2 Mauser are very, very powerful. They're a uh, they're an easy shutdown for a lot of those T1 units, especially bots. But even the vehicles really suffer under their uh, their besiegement. 
They're a stupidly powerful unit, but only when they're firing in the right direction. These medium tanks are more than happy to take a little trade against those Mauser if it means that there's a uh, relief of firepower on their front lines for just a little bit. Marls is going for a uh, Pulsar on the front lines here. That's quite interesting. Going to force these units back rather than uh, coax them back. Going to blast them away with blue tachyon accelerated light. Very, very nicely done. Oh, interesting. Going for a nuclear launcher in the back line here out of Dujabi. It's, I was just thinking it's about time here. We're 20 minutes into the game, so we should be seeing the backline players starting to go for uh, what you might consider the, uh, the end all game. Wow, this, uh, this is a, a real skeptic right here. <laughs> this is a man who is not interested in somebody EMPing their uh, anti-duke here. I have a feeling, I have a feeling Shut Up and Take My T2 might have been traumatized in the past. Uh, you can see this is exact, this is a uh, EMP defense system because these are cloaks, so the spy bot, any spy bots trying to walk their way through here are not going to notice these, and so they will trigger them. They will uh, alert the defenses here, which will fire on them promptly. promptly. Uh, and everything will be saved. That is a hilarious solution, but it is a perfect one. Yeah, I mean, I would I would struggle to find a way to EMP this unless maybe you could walk a spy bot up here quick enough and maybe time it just right to pop just on the right timing. But still, that would be that. Would, I mean, that would just be an impressive feat, all things considered. Well, there's actually another nuclear launcher I didn't even notice, but it looks like Shut Up and Take My T2 also has a nuke charged and ready, and is uh, looking for a spicy meatball to land that nuke at as well. Huge wreckage field here, by the way. Do we have superior me superior uh, superior metal vision, or was that lost in the update? Looks like it was lost in the update. We'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. If we select a uh, constructor here, go like this. You can see about 8,000 metal in that wreckage field. Well worth reclaiming. I love to see that we're using the construction bots from the early game to do that, although they're a little bit miscued here. Not the end of the world by all means, but uh, sort of sort of uh, inefficient, I would say. Why are we sending the fighters in? There are no bombers whatsoever. Tons and tons of those fighters just went down to a single shot from a long-range anti-air tower. That was quite nice. There's a uh, screamer or screecher or whatever the uh, whatever shot that missile. That's uh, I mean quite nice certainly. Oh, we've got some ticks running through. Not enough sufficient uh, light defense over here on the left-hand side, and so these ticks are running right on by, well into the back line here. Uh, yeah, lightning turret comes up eventually. That'll, that'll do it to defend from the, from this back here, but there's uh, still a big problem. Oh, I hear a nuke charged. Where is it firing? Oh! <laughs> Looks like he EMP'd a anti-nuke over there. He was uh, cautious about it, but he managed to do it on his own. Got the EMP off on one of those, uh, on one of those little, uh, little anti-nuke citadel systems and managed to launch the nuke into the back line. Wow. All right, very nicely done. Excellent nuke right there, taking out a huge eco center of the blue team. Oh, he's got another spy bot back here too. He does have another spy bot back there. He could go for it again. <laughs> of all, Mickey doesn't realize what happened. The uh, the anti nuke was stalled, and so there was a uh, there was no anti nuke there for just a moment. This nuke was launched, but it headed right into an anti nuke field over on the left hand side of the map. So luckily for the red team, that was charged and ready. <laughs> Look at him asking in the chat, did you EMP, EMP that? He sure did. All right, that's what we need to see because the red team is bearing down on them. With this tick spam coming in over here, I mean, they're, they're barely holding it together. Air to shut down a tick spam is not exactly what we want to see. I think these guys need to get to work on a beamer turret or two. Start to shut all this down. Pop Melon is marching the commander forward here, trying to just get a D-gun, I think do things the old-fashioned way. He's gonna have to watch the replay. <laughs> Very nicely done. Now I want to see what this spy bot's gonna do over here. I am so curious. Do we have any more spy bots? I don't see any more on the other side of the field. So it looks like we just have the one more chance in order to pull this off again. Clearly, this uh, this was because of the strategy that he was going for. I tend to find that the most hilarious when uh, it happens a lot with air players, right, that are going for a, a huge bombing run. They'll focus so heavily on, on bombing or whatever that they'll do absolutely no static defenses or anything like that, and so they will be completely open to harassment here. Uh-oh. EMP did go down on the Citadel system. Do we have the nuke launched? 
Oh, is it in the right spot? I didn't see if it was in the right spot or not. Up goes the nuke. I think it is. I'm trying to trying to guess the angle of it. I didn't see an anti-nuke launch, so I think that's going to be it. Manages to pull it off not once, but twice in the same match. And the nuke lands right in the middle of the back line. Huge nukes getting two of the major players out of this game. What a phenomenal play right there. EMP nuker. Put ticks around your anti. <laughs> Impressive work. Evolved Monkey has no choice but to acknowledge how difficult that is to pull off and what a phenomenal maneuver that was. Very, very nicely done, sneaking in a couple of those nukes. Definitely able to turn the tides of this game now with two of the major eco sources out of this game. The red team still has 500-ish metal per second coming in, but the blue team, uh, maybe that was just from reclaim. Yeah, it looks like it's from reclaim, but of course that cannot be under undercounted here. It's definitely putting things more and more in favor of the blue team, though. Pulsars in the middle of the map, firing away, whittling down whatever they can. They need a couple of pinpointers in order to make those fire a little bit more effectively here. Still not the end of the world, though. Eventually, that tick spam will be turned off. Uh, well, oh, okay, so that was actually... Bombardier was the tick spammer. <laughs> One way to turn off the tick spam. I mean, a Juno would have worked, too, but I suppose a nuke in the back line is not a bad option, either. Anti-nukes are coming up, and you can see they're just being spread all over the place. They are not interested in having any more nuclear shenanigans go down. I don't see any more uh, spy bots all around the map, so I think that's all she wrote. But what a phenomenal showing right there. I'm going to turn the music down a little bit. I think it might just be a little bit too loud here. Find myself yelling at the top of my lungs. Maybe not the most comfortable viewing experience. Gonna try Canyon. The front lines are mostly stagnant. It's a lot of artillery fire and tick spam. So these nukes are really the biggest play of the game here. Tumbleweeds were built up there for some reason. Canyon gets nuked, and that's gonna take out all of the static defense, allowing these ticks and these pawns and everything else to leak on through. That was very, very good. Gauntlet, the only thing standing in the way. It looks like the blue team is uh, tapping out. They're dropping like flies, despite the red team pulling off some impressive nukes right here. And, uh, yeah, this is definitely a winnable game. Always a bummer to see someone drop. One of those players left earlier, but there's another one that tapped out just a little too early, I feel like. I think it must have been this player over here. What was his name? Sp Spint? Splint or something like that? <laughs> I can't remember exactly. Leaving Marls with uh, effectively the entire front line here. That's a, uh, I mean, that's quite an ask for any one person. Bombers are out, and they're patrolling. Oh, okay. That's what happens if you left click and drag in a circle. Um, but not exactly what you're hoping for here. Did that work? Feels like that shouldn't have worked, but I guess it kind of did. I mean, they bombed a, a wind turbine farm right here, and they bombed some of these tanks right here. Uh, I don't know if that was actually worth it. <laughs> I think there was a lot of bombers for not a whole lot of success. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that those bombers were probably not able to do much there. Razorbacks are out, and those are uh, hard to deal with. Nuke goes up, but there is an anti-nuke in place over on the right-hand side here. Uh, where is it? Wait. Oh, there it is. Oh, no, not that one. Who actually fired? I don't know which anti-nuke actually fired, but the uh, green player has decided to pull the trigger here. You can see him just collapsing forward. These snipers have been built up to enough numbers where they can actually shut down that T3. Very nicely done. sound down a little bit. I'm just checking my sound levels, always trying to, uh, to maximize it and make sure things are sounding quite nice here. Yeah, that's not bad. Try and get it a little lower than my voice here. Just to balance things out a little bit more. That probably sounds about right. Okay. 
Uh, Evolved Monkey's base is getting collapsed in by all these sharpshooters. Yeah, he's uh, he's got a full surround now, and the blue team, I believe, has managed to pull themselves back. If he can take down this uh, this front line of Evolved Monkey, then uh, there's not going to be much that stands in the way here. Razorbacks, of course, not going to stand up against that many sharpshooters. They're uh, a very potent unit, and they are eager to tear down T3 as quickly as possible. Thug serving as a perfect meat shield here as well. Not able to take a ton of damage, but enough to allow those sharpshooters the time that they need. Thugs are already getting to work here on the economy, though. There go the energy converters. Sharpshooters bringing down some of these tanks with them. <laughs> we're going to hell, we're bringing you with me. Sharpshooter rain will eventually cease, but there's more green sharpshooters right over here. And uh, Evolved Monkey is going to start taking hits on his commander. Not ideal whatsoever. Welders starting to run through over on this side as well. We've got uh, rocket spiders and hounds in order to clean this up. Interesting. I was uh, saying the other day how I'd appreciate those rocket spiders being included in a unit group, and I really think it's it's a, a good idea here. You can see that when the units are standing still, or if you're in the right position, those uh, rocket spiders can really do a number on anything that walks past them. You have to essentially be facing things head on or running away head on uh, in order for those rocket spiders to hit effectively. But if you do manage to do that, then you're going to be in a really, really nice position. This is where the game is being won, by the way. This is the this is the game-winning move. Excellently done by Marls here. Oh. Nuke was fired. Anti-nuke will meet it across the map here. Saw the shadow on the ground. That's how detailed this game is. Anyways, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is where the game is won here, is all these res bots eating up all of this juicy, juicy metal. You can see in the middle of the map, almost 25,000 metal just waiting to be reclaimed up by these hungry little robots. And uh, all that metal heading back to the blue team is going to swing this heavily in their advantage, as you can see there, pulling in about 1,000 metal per second, where the red team is only lingering around 750. It's a, uh, it's a very one-sided battle currently at this point. Evolved Monkey's fusion reactors do pop, and that's going to be the majority of his uh, economy burned down to ashes by the, uh, the humble T1 units coming out of the blue team here. Starlight's, however, not a humble T1 unit whatsoever. The Starlight is a very, very powerful T2, and it, uh, it, it has earned its fear. It is capable of dispersing a burst of light that can do a tremendous amount of DPS. It's the kind of unit that you want to shut down T3, shut down the uh, heavy T2, like, uh, well, for instance, uh, the Czar or the Mammoth, anything like that. But effectively, anything with a high HP pool. That's the scenario, by the way, with the Rocket Spiders that you want them in. You can see they're, they're sort of facing head first into the enemy here, and so their rockets actually have a decent chance of colliding with it. That's where you can use them effectively, and that's why they're good on the front lines, uh, rather than lingering in the back. If they're, uh, if they're up against their enemy one-to-one, -one, they'll have a great time. Right-hand side is being pushed through here. That is a lot of czars. <laughs> a massive army of czars here. Ooh, and I think this is going to be a juicy connection for those czars. Massive hits. Trading that T1 army for a massive, massive efficiency ratio. That was beautiful. Beautiful to see the carnage. There are some gunships coming over this way. Yeah, EMP bomber gonna start dropping its payload, I do believe. Uh, and then of course we have the gunships here, the Hornets, going to sting away at all of these tanks trying to roll on through. Uh, those Hornets do a tremendous amount of damage to uh, anything with armor on it. They fire a Sabo volley that can do quite a bit of damage. EMP bomber is really the star of the show here, showing us just how powerful they can be to delay a push like this and reduce its effective pushing power quite tremendously here. These Rs are getting very low on health. Even a Janus able to take one down. <laughs> it's not every day, but it's uh, it's powerful. Oh, did the tanks spy the advanced fusion reactor? I think they did. They are about to turn around and I think they realized they were just seconds away from killing an advanced fusion reactor. They do jump on top of it. Archangel, Archangel. Not using his D-gun, and he will be blown to smithereens, taking down Adam 628 or 6285's base alongside him. That hurts. Will the blue team be able to clutch up here? 
I think what they need to do is move this vanguard a little further forward. It could stand to be over on this hill right here. Move it over to this spot so that it can start raining away in this direction and it can start raining in this direction. Both of which are going to be very, very powerful. I think we need to solidify this right hand side, which actually I think we're doing a great job of. These sharpshooters are going to shut down any, any uh, more armored craft that start moving in here. These medium tanks are going to contribute a lot of health to just soak things up. Uh, and the vanguard here are quite nice to disperse long ranged justice afar. <laughs> Marl's doing a great job of microing, I mean, massive armies here, just uh, holding on for dear life across three or four different fronts at this point. Yeah, you've kind of got a front lane here, a front lane here, a front lane here, and a front lane here. Um, alternatively, you could move this one and this one over and have a front lane here, a front lane here, kind of a deal. Um, either way, doing the job of four man on the backs of one. That is a, uh, that is a very, very impressive feat, to say the very least. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind this being switched over to grunts, actually, and just using grunt spam to give yourself the vision that you need. If we take a look at the blue team's vision, I bet it's quite poor. Yeah, not a, not a whole lot of vision at the moment. We have ticks that are kind of running by, and so those are providing the vision that we need in order to uh, kind of guesstimate where the enemy is. I don't think it's enough, though, um, and I'd love to see maybe a couple of scouter plane in, in, uh, inter interwoven into the aerial composition here. Diego, however, has done a decent job of mopping everything up with his airplay. It certainly has been on point here with those EMP bombers, those Hornets. All that stuff has been very, very nicely done. So uh, minor criticisms on the back of a relatively successful campaign. Mose is in a little bit of trouble here. I think this is the last bastion that the, red, or the blue team needs to break in order to fully collapse on the red team. If we just see a little bit of attention diverted in this direction and we manage to crack the hot pink shell, yeah, things are going to turn around very, very quickly here for the red team. Where'd those snipers go? Ah, oh, the snipers are lingering back here. Yeah, if we move these snipers forward and they start connecting shots with a lot of this base over here, they start popping all this. I mean, snipers don't care about plasma deflectors, so they're uh, they're easy to crack with those sharpshooters. That could be one way to uh, easily manage to break this front line. Once this front line collapses, you have so many attack angles to get into the back line here for the red team that I think the blue team would be able to swiftly and justly uh, execute victory. Vanguard's still firing away. It's dumb firing over here for some reason. Exactly why, I could not tell you, but it is. It is the state that we currently find it in. Sharpshooters and Vanguards managed to deal with all those Tigers that were pushing through the uh, Eastern Valley here. And that will all be mopped up very quickly. That's a lot of Tiger tanks. Tigers don't go down in one hit to the sharpshooters, same as the T1 medium tanks, so not quite as effective. Yeah. The sharpshooters, that is. But the uh, they're still very, very powerful, and especially if the tanks are just going to sit here like this, you might as well just pop a couple of shots off on them, pull your snipers back under static defense, uh, wait for them to cool off again, and keep doing that, and eventually that army's going to be whittled down really, really quick. Now the AI shell, or the... Uh, the, the LRPC shelling here from these vanguards is quite nice. Starting to uh, scuff up a lot of these units and in fact bringing down even a few of them. Oh, nuke does go down over here. There was an opening and he took it. Manages to break that entire base with one single strike. What a massive, massive hit right there. Taking down the entire front line of Moe's. Now all that stands between the red team and an army of blue are this line of tiger tanks. Yeah, this uh, mobile anti-nuke. The only thing holding on here for the uh, <laughs> for the red team. The only thing holding their front lines together. This is really nice. I like that we're building static defense back here. Um, although I think we should probably build it forward, right? Keep keep building this in a kind of a this sort of a direction or a this sort of a direction. Either one is going to work really nicely. Still not bad. And uh, I would say we could probably bother to send a couple of these. Just... Uh, Maybe three of them. Disperse them as such, and then reclaim a big old field. You can see 18,000, 19,000 metal lying around on the field by this point. 
uh, and that is going to cement your victory solidly in stone here. There's not a lot to hold the middle of the map against all of these medium tanks that are swarming forward. The beamer turrets trying their very best, but there's just only so much that static defense can do against that many numbers. The titan rolling forward, of course, going to be able to do a huge amount of damage. Evo Monkey does manage to degun down the Titan, but it will be at the cost of his own life as the medium tanks provide that necessary fire support to shut down any hidden commanders lurking in the mire. Fighter screen will be sent forward and it will try to take out a couple of those EMP bombers. They were partially successful, however, there was a lot of anti-air here. So uh, for the most part, those uh, fighters were shut down. Shiva were produced and that's quite nice. Shiva are very, very strong, but again, they are, uh, they're extremely prone to shooting themselves in the toes. <laughs> you, uh, you, you put a single tick running towards a Shiva and it will overcalculate by a mile and shoot itself right in the feet. Uh, Evolved Monkey has somehow or another coagulated all of the commanders over to this area. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that's funny, but it's very odd. Is that all of them? That is all of them. Are these, oh no, they're decoy commanders. Oh, that's odd. Decoy commanders are not supposed to have a name tag over them. That's quite funny. I, I, they were so good at being a decoy commander that they convinced even me. <laughs> Evolved Monkey's base proper will go down to the gunships as well as the medium tank swarm. And now there was not much standing in the way for the blue team to continue pressing forward. What a back and forth and back again match. Really, really cool to see. The red, t the red team, I will remind you, was leaking through on the left-hand side. They had pushed the blue team back to essentially right here. Uh, and they managed to claw themselves back with two beautiful nukes into the back line, swinging the economies. There was hardly anything the red team could do. It turned off the tick spam, which was very, very convenient. And uh, all said and done, I think it was exactly what they needed at exactly the right time in order to come back in this match at this point. This is just the death of a death of a man in slow motion. Triggernauts are very tanky. Very, very difficult to kill one of these bad boys, so the welders will instead just walk on past, and I don't think that's the wrong decision whatsoever. Another commander death right there. No, sorry, fusion death. It was a neat little explosion. I thought it was a commander death. Turns out it was a uh, just a cloaked fusion reactor that was eventually found here. The Thor pushing forward, or rolling forward rather, using its EMP missile as I always love to see, but that will be all she wrote here for the red team as they realize that all hope is lost. They will destroy and scuttle every resource they have to, de to deprive the uh, blue team of any advantage going forward in the war. But that is going to mean a swift victory for the blue team across this planet's surface. What an exciting match. I really enjoyed that one. Those were some phenomenal EMPs right into the nukes. I was not jabated. That was an epic game. Certainly can't get any better than that on all that glitters. I hope you had a phenomenal time watching, and I hope more than anything else that you have a great rest of your day. Hope you'll consider liking and subscribing, of course, down below, and I will see you in the very next of videos. Peace out, folks.